All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning in the Old Testament panorama class. Uh, as you will remember, uh, John, Mark, Claire, and Grace all went to Cambodia last week and are still there ministering to and, and serving alongside Ryan and Rebecca Quay. Um, they have had a wonderful, though exhausting trip so far. It sounds like they're doing really well, and God is just richly blessing the ministry of Ryan and Rebecca there, and there's lots of opportunities, lots of gospel opportunities. So we've gotten some encouraging reports back already, and I just can't wait to hear the full story of their trip and all that they're seeing and uh, seeing that the Lord is doing over in Cambodia um, when John and Mark uh, return. And then, of course, Claire and Grace will be coming back not too long after that, a few more weeks, to help the Quays travel with their kiddos back here for their furlough. And so uh, just a wonderful ministry that our church has joined up with there, uh, Ryan and Rebecca. We should keep them in our prayers. I encourage you uh, to remember them in, in prayer. I'm, I'm confident we'll probably mention something in the service this morning as well. And uh, so we'll, we'll pray here to start our time in, in looking at uh, God's Word and looking specifically at the next section in the study that we've been going through in the Old Testament panorama class. I have not been in the class. So I'll try to be as, as, as congruent and continuous as possible, given that I haven't been in the class, but I've been uh, given John's notes and lots of great uh, help from him on how to help you guys in the next stage of what we're looking at in God's Word together. That is specifically the divided kingdom. And and then within a subcategory of that, we're going to be looking at Israel, which is the northern kingdom. Um, it's not exactly a very happy topic, to be honest. The northern kingdom was definitely not walking with the Lord. Uh, you could say they had one good king, and even he, it says, was evil in the sight of the Lord. So he didn't even qualify uh, as a good king, and, and he did some good things at one point. So we're going to look at some of that. It's going to be somewhat of a broad overview, because um, there's, there's certain helpful aspects of it for our general study of, of this section of scripture, but at the same, we're going to zero in on some key representative issues. Um, we'll look at particular, a few of the kings in particular that'll kind of be a good representation of the whole. Um, so as we're getting started in that, uh, we need to look to the Lord for help in this um, because we want to understand not just the facts of the Bible, right? That's not the goal of a class like this. I know that's not John's heart, is that we would just know more facts about the Bible. It's that we would come into a greater understanding and greater relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, the author of this incredible um, book, and that we would come and encounter him in this book, not just facts about it. So that's gonna, I'm going to pray for God's help in that way, that we would not just look at this as a book of facts and figures or historical um, subjects, but as the living word of God that it is. And it can impact us this morning right here in this class, and we should pray to that end. Um, and I'll also pray for John uh, and Mark and Claire and Grace as they minister overseas alongside our, our missionaries. So let's pray now and ask the Lord for help there, and we'll get started. Bow with me and bow our heads together. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you and are so thankful. God, we are so grateful. This truly is your living word. God, you have revealed yourself to us. What an incredible gift. And we pray, Lord, that as we look at these stories, as we look at these um, facts and figures and historical um, events and people, Lord, that we wouldn't just look at them as intellectual knowledge to be gained or, or thought about or talked about. Would you reveal more about yourself, Lord, through these people? Some of them, in, in this case, especially in the northern kingdom of Israel, deeply fallen and even wicked people. Lord, show us the purity of your holiness in contrast to this ugliness. Um, help us to see that we can only survive and thrive in this world if we are called according to your purposes. And that, Lord Jesus, you made a way for that to happen by dying on the cross for our sins and, and calling us your own. Lord, we can understand truth. We can understand beauty. We can understand goodness only because you have given us eyes to see it and behold it. So help us this morning, Lord, to behold it in your word together as we look at this challenging era of Israel's history. And Lord, we do pray that as you enlighten our eyes and, and our hearts in this matter, that you would also be with many thousands of miles away, that you would be with John, Mark, Claire, and Grace as they minister alongside our dear missionaries, Ryan and Rebecca and their family. Uh, Lord, give them strength and stamina. I know it's an exhausting trip with um, 
lots of in-country travel as well, not a lot of opportunities for rest. So I pray that you would give John and Mark in particular a, a great strength and endurance to, to bless and encourage Ryan as they, in particular, as they wrestle with what the next steps of this ministry could look like. Um, Lord, we pray that you would continue to bring many um, to saving faith in you as a result of the hard work of our missionaries. And Lord, we pray that I know that their deepest heart would be for those to be saved and for other workers to be equipped well in this area, especially in Ratanakiri. So Lord, we pray to that end that they would um, see and discern what would be the best way to move forward in this ministry in the coming uh, weeks and months and years, Lord. May you be glorified in all these things. Help us, O Lord, this morning. We need your help, and we submit ourselves to you in that. We pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Well, as I alluded to in the opening, um, and even in my prayer, this is not an exactly rosy picture or like really exciting, like happy place to look at Israel. Um, This is a rough chapter in Israel's history. And and by way of reminder, I think you've seen this chart a number of times, and and I think it's in your notes. It's really helpful. Okay. This is kind of the the chronology, the big picture chronology of the Old Testament, if you will. And what you're going to see here is, does John call that the fishtail? What does he call that? I'm not sure what it'll call it, but the first kings uh, happens at the very end there, you see the divided kingdom and the division of the kingdom. And you'll, see, you'll notice a couple things start to, to branch off and happen. You've got the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And there's two different exiles that happen. And they have a slightly different flavor. We're going to be looking at the first one uh, somewhat this morning. And that's the Assyrian exile. And that's for the northern kingdom. And then Assyria gets overthrown, essentially, by Babylon as a world power. And then the Babylonian exile takes place when they finally conquer and overwhelm Jerusalem and take much of the inhabitants off into captivity. Um, And that's the captivity you may be honestly most familiar with in some ways. That's the one where we talked about it lasting 70 years, and they return to the land under Ezra and Nehemiah. So if you recall, I'm quite confident John would have tracked this thread already through his classes. But one of the primary threads you're seeing through here is the throne of David, right? The the throne of Judah, right? The, the, The seed of the Messiah is the question that is happening all throughout the Old Testament and even into the New Testament, right? That's, that's where we see the advent of Christ as so magnificent and amazing and astounding. This is the one foretold. This is the one that the thread has been traced all the way through. And that's what we're seeing throughout um, these histories that we're experiencing here. And in First Kings, we see a, 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 this division happen, and we see that the northern kingdom, okay, you have to remember some of these, these old history facts a little bit from previous books, because a lot of it has to do with the tribes of Israel, the, the families of Israel, the sons of Israel, of Jacob right? It divides across family lines to some degree. So the world could look at this and even think, oh, well, this division that's going to happen, it's really largely political, or really it's just a family squabble down through the generations. They just all hate each other, and that's really what happened here. Well, we know that that's certainly on the surface what it would look like, and it, really, and it was to a large degree, but there's a lot more that's going on, and, and the Word of God reveals that to us, and so we'll, we'll get into some of those details, but you could look at it like that, because what happens is the ten tribes split off. That's the division. The ten tribes split off, and the two remain, Judah and Benjamin, in uh, Jerusalem, in Judah, in Judah, okay? And so you have that split happen, and we're going to be looking primarily at the northern kingdom this morning, the kingdom that is referred to as Israel. And it can be a little confusing when you say, oh, well, isn't all of it called Israel, right? Uh, yes, but in, in particular, you'll see the pattern in Scripture is that the northern kingdom is referred to as Israel, and the southern kingdom is referred to as Judah. So I'll try to keep that as straight as I can, and <laughs> you can hold me to it if you want. Um, but that's a good overview of where we're going. Remember, the Assyrian exile pertains to the northern kingdom. That's what we'll cover this morning. Uh, And then this is another overview chart um, of the kings of Israel and Judah. And so what's helpful for this, is this in your guys' notes? 167 167 in your notes. This um, is a helpful chart because you'll see the overlap. Sometimes there's overlap between the different kings. and, uh, And I think you also have one that includes the prophets, correct? The different prophets who would minister at different times to the, to the kings. Is that correct in your notes? Somebody give me a nod or a yes. It, it, probably the next page or so. It might look like this. Let me see if it's... Uh, 
You, you do have it? I have it coming up here in a little bit, so we'll, we'll talk about that some more. But there's overlap here. Okay, there's historical overlap. This is a really helpful chart to outline that. We're not going to spend a ton of time on this one um, right now, but uh, this is a, a good chart to be familiar with as far as where do you place these different dynasties, these different kings, and their different, uh, and a queen, Queen Ethelia as well in Judah. It's an interesting, uh, <laughs> tragic story there um, related to the northern kingdom of Israel, which we won't have time for this morning, um, but I believe John will be covering some in, in the following ones. So. Really good overview. This morning, though, we're going to focus in on something to, to start with. Does anyone know um, what the what are some primary reasons for this division? I've kind of alluded to it a little bit. There's some that you'd see on the surface. Some of it you'd see on the surface. They've never really gotten along a whole lot in Israel and Judah. Um, so there is some that's going to be years and years and years and years of history um, between between one another's tribes. But does anybody know any um, direct, let's say direct uh, causes uh, of the division of the kingdoms? Go ahead and raise your hand or ring any bell. I'm not going to switch to the next slide because it actually kind of gives it away. So, any ideas? Remember, we're coming from the. I'll, I'll give you a little more background. We're coming from David, and then Solomon, and now who's going to reign after Solomon? Jeroboam's going to be one of them. He's going to be north, but who starts it? Rehoboam, Rehoboam the son of. Solomon. So the son of Solomon. So we're going kingly line. Okay. Solomon. Now Rehoboam is going to rule. And I think you, Kara. <laughs> uh, so Kara said, uh, in, in this was an answer to my first question about what's kind of some direct, co- like you know, corollaries or causes to this. What's the, what, how did, why did this happen? And Kara said, it's because God said it would happen. That's actually incredibly important for us to remember. Do you, do you guys know what she's referring to in particular? Does that ring a bell for anybody? Where did God say this was going to happen? Testing our Bible knowledge together. It's in the book that nobody wants to read. Is that enough of a hint? That's bad. I shouldn't have said that. We all want to read God's word. But it is a book that's a little, a little off-putting at times for us. Leviticus. Leviticus is where God tells us in chapters 25 and 26, God tells us very directly, he says to Israel, he's telling Israel, if you follow my ways, if you follow my commands, if you follow the way of life that I've set before you, you will have abundance in the land. You will have plenty. You will have uh, safety and security. You will have all the blessings of the promised land if you follow my ways. Well, what does he follow that up with in Leviticus? Same spot, 25 and 26. He follows it up with a, a heavy warning that if you don't, there will, be, there will be curses, not blessings. If you don't follow my way, there are consequences to that. Severe consequences of that. Up to and including exile from the land. So Israel knew. Who, who wrote Leviticus? Moses. When, we know Moses didn't enter the promised land, right? So we know that Israel knew this before they entered the promised land. They knew what was expected of them. God made it incredibly clear. Kara is exactly correct. God made it clear. He said this would happen if you depart from my way. There's only one result. Severe, severe consequences. So yeah, Kara, that's exactly it. Now let's get. Now let's go. go in. Uh, yeah, Gus, you want to add to that or? or? Yes. So let's go. Yeah, exactly. So that's what I was going to say. Let's zoom in even further now. So the. So we've got God saying so. Now Gus, go ahead and elaborate on that. So coming out of David, now Solomon, and now we have Rehoboam, and and Gus, go ahead. No, no, this is open. This is open. What's, what's some of those direct causes related to Solomon? Well, so because of, because of Solomon's power, Israel became the kingdom of the rest of the land. Yeah. 
Yeah, so to summarize what Gus said, Solomon had a half heart for God, right? That's one way to think of it. Um, very, very ha- helpful way to think of it is Solomon had a half heart for God. Um, we contrast that, of course, with his father, David. Um, but Solomon, now moving from him to Rehoboam, God says what Solomon has done, especially toward, it seems, the end of his reign, but, but certainly throughout, what did he do for himself? What did he, what did he add to what God had given him. Many wives and gold. Many horses, many wives, much gold. And then what did he do? And specifically, it's linked up with foreign, the foreign wives in particular, but, but ultimately Solomon's decisions. He, exactly. So John said that he built altars. And not only did he build altars, he supplied them. He made them nice for many gods. And it seems that he even had some hand in the worship being spread throughout Israel of pagan idolatry. This is Solomon. Talk about a half heart for God. Yeah, well, what was the other half for? Himself and idols. And so now we're seeing, as, as the division starts to happen, we see an incredible shift. Now, Gus said, it's not necessarily going to happen in Solomon's lifetime. It happens in the lifetime of his son, Rehoboam. So now we're moving on to Rehoboam. Does anybody remember what happened with Rehoboam as far as, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's a, it's a strength metaphor. His little finger, Rehoboam said, my little finger is, gonna be, is thicker than my, my dad's thigh. In other words, his strength is nothing compared to my strength. His brutality, nothing compared to my brutality. Yeah, so to summarize real quick, the idea that was, was happening here for Rehoboam is he gets the kingdom and now comes forward from the people and from a, seems like maybe a faction of the people um, that Jeroboam is going to represent. He's going to come in as representative and say, please, Release us from the burdens that your father has put on us. We, we've been heavily burdened, not, not just in taxes, but in forced labor. And Jeroboam would know. Jeroboam was put in charge of the forced labor by Solomon. So he would know. He would know what was going on here. He had very intimate knowledge of this. He had been in charge of the forced labor. So he comes as a representative of this maybe factious group, but certainly a group representative of the people to say, Rehoboam, please don't treat us like your father treated us. Give us a break. Okay, so then what does Rehoboam do? He says, wait a second, come back to me in three days. Hold on, one sec, you know, three days. And he talks to some people, he gets some counsel. He talks to the elders, and what do the elders say? Listen to them, yeah, be kind. <laughs> Release these people from these burdens. Why do they say that? These elders, it says they were alive in the time of Solomon. They, so they knew. They were probably Solomon's age. They were older men who not only had an authority role in Israel, but they, they knew. They'd seen all this stuff. Rehoboam wasn't young. We're told that he was 41 when he assumed the throne. So he's not a young guy. But compared to these guys, he certainly is, and they knew a thing or two. They'd seen a lot. Okay, so their advice, be kind, be gracious. Yes, Rehoboam, you'll have the people on your side if you just give them a break. Okay, so then Rehoboam talks to his generation. Gen Z. No, I'm just kidding. Um, Rehoboam talks to his generation more, his contemporaries, and he says, what do you guys say? And what's their response? Tax them even more. Yeah, yeah. And so then he comes out exactly as we just heard. Then Redbone comes out and says, okay, here's the deal. My pinky is thicker than my, my dad's thigh. I am going to be way more brutal on you guys. And not only that, my, my dad whipped you with whips, regular whips. I'm going to drive you to forced labor with scorpions, which were those multi-barbed whips. He, he is upping the ante. Now, why would, think about it politically. Think about it as a, as a human ruler. Why do you think someone would do that? Why do you think someone would come out like that? Pride, insecurity. What do you think he hopes to gain? Submission. What was it? Fear. More wealth. Yeah, that's practical. Fear, submission, intimidation. The world's way of doing things, 
sometimes even works for the short term, maybe even the long term. We see the evil in our world sometimes succeed. And Rehoboam gets this contemporary advice, and he's like, I'm in. Let's go. Let's ramp it up. And so instead of, instead of accepting wise counsel, we'll uh, move forward here now. Rehoboam's rejection of wise counsel was an, a, a direct corollary to what's going to happen in the division of the kingdom. Just one sec. So you'll see that this kind of summarizes what we just talked about. And the, the, the personal ambition of Jeroboam is what we're going to talk about here next in a second. But um, Gus, you had something. I'm not sure I can fully summarize for everybody what you said. I hope, I hope you heard what Gus said. It's, it's, it's spot on and, and very helpful reminder. The, the best summary I'll give is this. God is sovereignly in control of all these things. And yet in the, the human element of it, we see the human motivations. We see what's happening around Rehoboam. And we see that even before that, God said, and we're going to get there, God said to Jeroboam, through the prophet, he says, you will get the kingdom. It's going to be torn from Rehoboam. You will get 10 tribes. So we're going to go there in a second. But Gus was making the point that we might wonder and our heads might hurt a little bit and thinking like, well, okay, but how is it possible that, that this evil thing that's happening, God said that it didn't have to happen, but it, but it is happening. And this is, we, we're trying to wrap our heads around that. Well, one of the best examples of where we see the, the, the heaviness of the wicked human heart pursuing all kinds of wickedness against God's, um, uh, against God's anointed, in this case, is, is Christ himself, right? We see that evidence right there on the cross. That's what, that's what Gus was sharing, was that we see an example of evil and wicked men. We see it with the life of Joseph, right? Uh, certainly. And, and then again, of course, the, the prime example in the life of Christ, that what men meant for evil, God said, no, this is all part of my plan. And I'm not at all ever out of control. Nothing comes as a surprise to God, though from our limited, imperfect vantage point, it can be confusing. It can be hard to grapple with. And that's, that's fair. Absolutely. Um, Gus, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, in, uh, in 1 Kings, if you have your Bibles with, with you, I'd, I'd love for us to go there. Um, I think this is a very helpful place to go together. 1 Kings chapter 11, we're going to learn a little bit more about Jeroboam. 1 Kings chapter 11, and it's uh, starting in verse 26. So we're, we, we, we kinda, we're kind of jumping our timeline a little bit, but I, I hope this is a helpful way to do it because we need to kind of learn the characters a little bit as we learn the timeline. So it's going to feel like a bit of a jumping timeline right now, but it'll, it'll smooth out, I promise. Um, but to understand the division of the kingdom, this is a critical aspect of this morning's class. And Rehoboam, we've kind of learned some about him, and I gave you a little teaser about Jeroboam. Okay, the teaser about Jeroboam, before we read next, was that he was, <clears throat> he was uh, part of Solomon's court, as it were. He was, he was on the side of the kingdom. Uh, and then we're, what we're going to read here uh, is, is exactly that. So read with me, uh, starting in verse 26. It gives a little bit of a, a, a background of who Jeroboam is. He's called a servant of Solomon um, in that verse. Uh, and then um, he says, he, and then in that, later in that verse, he says, he also lifted up his hand against the king. And now we're going to understand a little bit more about why. 
Verse 27. And this was the reason why he lifted up his hand against the king. Solomon built the millow and closed up the breach of the city of David, his father. Well, not really sure. Well, okay, well, what are we driving at here? Well, that was Jeroboam had had reasons for his anger against Solomon um, that that related directly to closing up the breach of the city of David, um, and and now the man Jeroboam it says in verse twenty eight was very able. So he he's he's got these concerns. Okay, he's got these concerns about how Solomon's running things and what he's doing, and then he's in position and very able. And Solomon saw, hey, this guy knows what he's doing. It says this. Solomon says that Jeroboam was industrious. He gave him charge over all the forced labor of the house of Joseph, like I said earlier. Uh, Verse 29, and at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem, the prophet Ahijah, the Shilonite, found him on the road. Now we're going to learn a little bit about the history on how Jeroboam came upon this prophecy. Now Ahijah had dressed himself in a new garment, and the two of them were alone in the open country. Then Ahijah laid hold of the new garment that was on him and tore it into twelve pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, Take for yourself ten pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I am about to tear the kingdom from the hand of Solomon and will give you ten tribes. But he shall have one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city that I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. Notice the thread of the throne of David. That's, that's never going to change. That's always going to be a consistent theme of what God is doing to preserve the messianic seed. Verse 33, because they have forsaken me. Oh, here's where we're getting, uh, again, the, the, the biblical, you know, the biblical uh, proof of why Solomon was having this happen. Um, I'm about to tear it from his hand. And it says, because they have forsaken me and worshipped Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of Moab, and Milcom, the god of the Ammonites. And they have not walked in my ways, doing what is right in my sight, and keeping my statutes and my rules, as David his father did. So he explains what's happening. This kind of gives us the biblical overview of what we've talked about so far. Um, And he says that uh, in verse 35, going on, it'll say, I'm going to take the kingdom... Okay, but I'm but in verse sixty, uh, uh, pardon me, thirty six. To his son, I am going to keep that one tribe. He's going to have that uh, there and in Jerusalem. Um, now, this is this is where things get really interesting. What happens between Jeroboam and the prophet? Between Jeroboam and the Lord here is fascinating to me. In verse thirty eight, God says to Jeroboam. And if you will listen to all that I command you and will walk in my ways and do what is right in my eyes by keeping my statutes and my commandments as David, my servant, did. Notice the thread. It's always going to be there. I will be with you and will build you a sure house as I built for David. And I will give Israel to you. And I will flick the offspring of David because of this. But not forever. That's not going to change. God's not changing his plan, but he will. He'll punish him for it. And he will exalt Jeroboam. He'll say, yes, I'm going to give you something awesome. If what? Follow me. And now, obviously, this must become known to Solomon. Because right after this, Solomon seeks now to kill Jeroboam. So now he goes into hiding. Um, he uh, goes kind of into self-imposed <laughs> exile, hiding in, in Egypt. And now once Solomon dies, this is where Jeroboam now comes in. So we can call it the personal ambition of Jeroboam, yes. But it was also linked with a promise, wasn't it? That if he would, if he would be God's instrument the right way, <laughs> then God will reward him. Because he'd be doing what God would will what God wants for his people and in doing so God's going to say okay I will reward you so instead what ends up happening is the personal ambition of Jeroboam certainly takes over and now we can kind of dive into a few more details about about what happens next oh try and skip ahead here make sure the slides are this is that uh, chart that I was mentioning I, do you guys have this in your notes something like this It's really a nice chart. You'll see the kings, the different dynasties, the dates, the years they reigned. And then in that box, you'll see um, right by the fourth dynasty at the bottom, you'll see Elijah is in box there. That's, That's the prophet. Do we have that in the notes? Anybody? Okay. 
I wasn't sure. This is a really helpful outline of it. We're not going to spend a lot of time here. Uh, now that we've kind of gotten the overview and, and what, what's going on with Rehoboam and Jeroboam, we're going to move, move forward um, on this. But these kinds of charts, I'll flip to the next one, um, are really helpful for seeing where this overlap is happening and especially what prophet is ministering. This is, this is in Israel, in the northern kingdom. So right now, the very early, early stages here, I'm going to go back. We're going to start with Jeroboam, and we're going to move down through these kings. Um, we're going to spend the most amount of time this morning on Jeroboam, uh, Ahaz, and then Jehu. That's where we'll spend most of our time this morning um, as we go along. I believe you've seen this before. This is kind of a nice little... Self, it, it, John had this, so to kind of give you a bit of a reference point for the size and space we're talking about. Uh, you'll notice the northern kingdom, um, before we dive back into the, to the story of Jeroboam, kind of get our bearings geographically, you see the northern kingdom uh, there in uh, kind of orange, uh, and then uh, the southern kingdom in green, the kingdom of Judah. And then, uh, let me see here. And then um, we'll, we'll actually pause. We'll, we'll pause back here on this slide for a second. Um, let's talk a little bit more now about Jeroboam. Now we've kind of laid the land of, of what's happening with Rehoboam, and we have up here a visual depiction of what's going on, of, of where we're talking about. Does anybody remember what happens next? So we, let's bring ourselves back to the story. So Jeroboam has come and besieged Rehoboam on behalf of this faction. So he comes now. Solomon's dead. Jeroboam comes back from Egypt and says, okay, we're here. We're here to make, make amends and make this right. And he knows the prophecy, certainly. He, he's been given that prophecy prophecy, but he starts by coming with a request for Rehoboam. Rehoboam denies it, right, viciously, and then what takes place is the splitting of the kingdom. Now, uh, what ends up happening is uh, the, the factions have now grown so deep that the, the people getting the decree from Rehoboam now fully revolt, and you've got the split of the ten tribes. Um, and you'll notice here that this is going to set the stage for the next era in the northern kingdom's history. So they're going to be now at risk. They're going to be the first, geographically speaking, first part of the land going to be at risk for attack from Assyria as Assyria moves through the first crescent, as they move through the king's highway, as, as you may recall from our geography class. And we'll, we'll see that here in a, in a, in a second. Um, as Rehoboam decides to go this route, he opens themselves up to uh, incredible failure as a, as a monarch and, and opens the land up to incredible vulnerability um, militarily and, and otherwise, and politically. Um, and so this, this secession and breaking of the union happens almost immediately, and only Rehoboam's closest countrymen stick with him. And instead, now we have Jeroboam, who takes control of the northern kingdom um, and sets up uh, his uh, kingdom along the lines of his own um, insecurities, if you will. So one of the things that uh, Jeroboam is going to do, we'll cover in just a second, uh, is is set up the kingdom in his own in his own vision, essentially, uh, th to accomplish his own ends. And I'd love if, if any of you can remember some of the things Jeroboam did. Be thinking about those because we're going to start dialoguing about what Jeroboam did to establish his kingdom. Um, but before that, you'll see here, this is what they've opened themselves up to, is, is this right here. This is the growth of the, um, you'll, you'll, you'll kind of see the growth of the Assyrian influence and their flourishing uh, through the Mesopotamian area. Uh, you'll notice that they're, uh, by the time we get to around where we're talking about, they're that light green color, overwhelming the area and start to press down into um, Jerusalem. In defending their territory, the Syrians, they became ruthless, um, ruthless warriors. They established themselves as ruthless warriors and, and a warrior kingdom, really, uh, conquering lands. And what they would do is they would replace the inhabitants of the land with other places, uh, other places inhabitants. And so they would maintain dominance over large stretches of land um, and, and do so um, under an iron fist, as it were. Um, this is kind of zooming in on modern day Iraq, show you kind of geographically where that is. 
Um, we'll get to this. This one, we're going to, this is kind of a cool picture of him, but this is one of the uh, conquerors of Assyria, Tiglath-Pileser, who ends up waging kind of the most of the, the battles against um, Israel later on. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. But before we do that, quick comparison of the, the two kingdoms that we have here. Um, you'll see that as they split, as Jeroboam takes the north and as uh, he leaves Rehoboam and his counterparts in the south, this is how you can compare the two kingdoms. You'll see that the northern kingdom is a significantly larger area. The southern kingdom much smaller. Um, and then you'll see that the differences on the, on the uh, northern kingdom side is, honestly, it tends to be, materially speaking, quite a bit nicer than the southern kingdom in some ways. Um, things to note in particular from this uh, is that you'll know, there's not a single righteous king. Uh, in, in the northern kingdom, whereas in the southern kingdom there's at least, we could call maybe 8 out of 20 of them to be righteous kings. And then you also notice that the capital is Samaria, which will play into biblical history for many years, many, many, many years to come through this as well. Um, and the capital is Jerusalem for the southern kingdom. You also notice that there are nine dynasties. What do we mean by dynasty in this case? Nine dynasties in the northern kingdom compared to the one dynasty in the southern kingdom. What are we talking about there? Family related. Yeah, family related. You could think of it like the um, right of kingship being passed on to a son. Well, what does that reveal to you that there's nine dynasties in the northern kingdom? Not unified. And not only they're not unified, they, they, they're, there's that constant upheaval of, of being basically afraid that you're going to be assassinated by the next guy who wants the throne. Right? Or militarily, once you're deposed, your family's not necessarily guaranteed. So you see a lot of really horrific things happen in the Northern Kingdom because they are, they're constantly warring with, within one another uh, for power and for, uh, for influence. And so you see a little, certainly a different approach in the Southern Kingdom. And what does that, again, reveal about the thread that I've kind of mentioned a few times now in the Southern Kingdom? God is keeping his promise. The, the, the Davidic throne will per, per, um, persevere through until the, the Babylonian exile later. It's remarkable to see God um, preserve that, and yet we see the stark contrast of the northern kingdom in complete disarray. As a reminder of the theme, John had this here. It's a helpful reminder. First Kings theme is faithful we stand, disobedient we fall. That's because early in the, in the book we see some, some, certainly some unity um, under, under Solomon, but then of course very quickly de devolves into disunity. Um, faithful we stand, disobedient we fall. Uh, this is a nice breakdown as well, uh, a nice chart about how this took place in terms of where it falls in the books. I believe this is in your notes. Um, we have a page number on that for people. 170. 170. Yeah, thank you. So page 170, you'll see these. This is a really helpful breakdown of 1 Kings. And then 2 Kings, the theme is disobedient we fall because that's all they do in 2 Kings. It's just one problem after another. Um, there's, there's not a lot of, uh, of, of good stuff to see, unfortunately, in, in 2 Kings as we unpack more about um, the divided kingdom in particular. Um, so you see in 2 Kings with that chart that helps kind of see, he breaks it down into the divided kingdom <clears throat> and the surviving kingdom. And while that is true to some degree, I mean, we start to see a little bit more of a picture of, of Judah, not just Israel. Um, it's still in the context, though, of, of this horrible situation that's happened with Israel that we're going to talk about out here in a second where they start to have um, uh, an incredible amount of um, warring, uh, you know, the, the Assyrians coming in and, and giving them trouble as well. Um, the uh, move to this spot right here, um, this is kind of the breakdown of the division of the kingdom that we've already talked about. And now we're looking specifically at uh, the Jeroboam's spiritual compromise. So move forward, we looked at this in the, the Word Together. This is, these are those verses that we talked about earlier where we see what uh, Jeroboam was, was after. Um, and now we're going to move on to a little bit more specifics about his kingdom that he decided to set up. So now that we've gotten here, done a little bit more overview, um, what do you guys recall about Jeroboam's vision of a kingdom? What his kingdom would look like and how would it differ from Rehoboam and Judah? You remember? Yeah. Well. 
Yeah. Jeroboam goes south pretty fast, not geographically. He, uh, he immediately establishes new altars, and not just new altars. What is he, do you guys remember what he says about the, the golden calves that you mentioned? It's shocking. Jeroboam, what are you doing? Yeah, Carmen just said, these are your gods, Israel, that got you out of Egypt. What does that remind you of? She's reminding you of something. How about when Aaron, when Moses is up on the, I still can't, it just boggles my mind still, but when Moses was up on the mountain, Aaron says, behold, the golden calf, this is the God that brought you out of Egypt, Israel, let's worship and party. While his brother is on the mountain speaking to Yahweh. What are you doing? So guys, the, the, the human heart here on vivid, awful display, the Jeroboam says, even after getting the prophecy, even after the prophecy starts to come true, Jeroboam says, great. Now I don't want to, I, I really, what I don't, what was happening is that in order for them to worship God, where would they have to go? Jerusalem. So his people, when they would do their religious Rituals to worship Yahweh would go to Jerusalem. That, as you mentioned, presents a huge threat to his power. In his mind, even though he sees the prophecy start to happen, start to come true, he thinks to himself insecurely, pridefully, unbelievably rebellious to God and says, okay, I got a solution for that. They don't need to travel all the way down. Don't travel all the way down there. And in fact, I'm going to set up priests. Whoever wants to be a priest can be a priest because we just need to make sure there's plenty of priests <laughs> and and he expels priests who would otherwise be serving the Lord faithfully in his lands. And he sets up altars, and not just altars, he sets up idols, and not just idols, he says, these are the gods that delivered you out of Egypt. The seminal moment in Israel's history. He is rewriting Israel's history to serve his own ends. You starting to see why we can say the northern kingdom was in such deep rebellion against the Lord that he would judge them and curse them the way he did? It's, un it's unbelievable what Jeroboam has done. And so not only does he set all this up, he, he well, I'll, I'll switch to the next slide as a kind of helpful summary of what Jeroboam is doing. He actually uh, sets these things up in opposition to God, in opposition to God's prophecy that was coming true to him, and establishes for himself a kingdom that is built on paganism. So, so right from the get-go, he turns to paganism. And instead of worshiping the Lord who prophesied all this and, and trusting the Lord, he, it required trust. Isn't that interesting? It required Jeroboam to trust the Lord and say, hey, it's, yeah, it's going to be okay. When these people go down, they're going to come back up and you will, you will get the land. Follow me. Right? He would require trust and Jeroboam would not trust the Lord. He had to have it his own way. He had to have it his own way. Um, it's a stark contrast. It's, it's, um, it's incredibly uh, sad to see on, on display here. Um, as we move through uh, the, the kings, uh, a number of these slides we'll, we'll move through. Um, we'll, we'll highlight the, 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 the next one in particular we'll talk about is Ahab. Um, but king after king after king, you'll notice if I stop at any of these slides, at some point in there it relates something horrible that they did. It, it, Jeroboam set this kingdom up for failure from the very beginning. And, and you'll notice that time and time and time again, God um, relates even kings back to previous kings. He did worse than the people before him. You know, God will use them as comparisons um, he, where Jeroboam started this off by taking God's entire system of holy days, sacrifices, and worship changed it into a man-made system focused on worshiping golden calves that he set up. Um, so God's response is that you've done more evil than all who lived before you. You've made for yourself other gods, idols made of metal. So you've stirred God's anger and turned your back on God. That's the, that's the verdict that's delivered on Jeroboam's life. Um, and really, I mean, if you think about it, it was doubly tragic because of that very prophecy that God had given him uh, that he could have followed after the Lord. Um, yeah, striking. So as we move through the kings, we don't see any, uh, any other trends, unfortunately. Um, we see Nadab is the next one. 
Um, Be'asha is the next one after him. Uh, this one uh, is another continuous, though it was the longest reign, he, is, he continued the exact same sins of Jeroboam. Uh, you'll notice that in a lot of these kings. Then Elah takes the throne. Uh, we can move on. Uh, we're going to stop on Omri. This is an interesting note here um, on Omri. This is what you'll find in the annals of Assyrian history. Uh, when they start to get closer, you'll notice the, the time frame here. The city had an excellent strategic position, served as a capital. This is where Omri is now um, kind of building up Samaria as a significant uh, edifice, as a significant fortress, essentially a, a hilltop fortress that um, I believe we may even have some, John may even have some pictures for us to see in a second about that. But um, yeah, in fact, it's Next, uh, it's it's a stunning, uh, a very well fortified area for the for the time, um, and this is where this is what's going to ultimately endure the the great assault of the Assyrian Empire, um, and so what they refer to it as Omri land because he was the king at the time. Uh, so Assyrian annals of history will will refer to it that way. This is another view of it. And you'll notice as he sets up the uh, Acropolis, as it were, it's, it's, you'll see the different um, elevation marks. It's very well defensible in, in many ways. Of course, they end up sieging um, and, and overrunning it eventually. This is uh, another couple of pictures. Whoops, oh, I didn't want too much. That's the ruins of the Acropolis. It's the West Gate. And then this is a really interesting note. I like to, I like where John has some history points for us that link us up with uh, the Middle Eastern history of the time in Assyria. What's been found is, is something, it's actually pretty uh, basic, uh, but it's instructive. Uh, these are called the Astraka of Samaria. Uh, it's really interesting that this was found around the time that dates to the, to the uh, time of Ahab. We're going to learn about here in a second, one of the uh, worst kings in the history of Northern Kingdom. Um, he, uh, th these seem to have been a, a record keeping um, that was done at that time. And it's something super banal. It's something super normal, but it's amazing how even like these little normal things, this would be like the equivalent of a receipt. Um, on pot shirts that they would record what was received, what taxes were received, what revenue were received at the time. And these were found in the palace, um, likely attributed to, to Ahab. So that's a really interesting note. I see these things confirming and just coming alongside a lot of the, the history we see here. Um, now, you may be familiar with Ahab um, already, so as we spend time on him, we'll kind of hit the highlights of, of his life, but uh, Ahab was the son and successor of Omri. Uh, he was really the... Um, I, probably the one you maybe know the most about because of the uh, scandal and wickedness of his of his rule. Um, who is Ahab married to? Jezebel. Jezebel. Why is that significant? Say again. She was Phoenician. She was daughter of a king. And then what what did she bring into the category? Or pardon me, what did she bring into the kingdom um, that Ahab fully embraced? Baal or Baal, it's pronounced different ways, but, so I'm not sure how I'll pronounce it, but yeah, Baal, um, worship. Uh, and what would be significant, do, does anybody know what would be significant about specifically Baal worship and the coming conflict with Elijah that we're going to, that we're going to talk through? What would be significant? Why is, why is Jezebel being a Baal, Baal, Baal worshiper, I'll try and say Baal every time, um, Baal worshiper, um, bringing that in, Ahab fully coming into, uh, his own with that and, and embracing Baal worship and setting up all these um, Asherahs and all these different altars for Baal. What's significant about that as we relate it to Elijah? Because these are kind of those big points we all kind of know, but why, what does it matter about Baal? Do you know anything about Baal that would be significant? Ari? Yeah, yeah. So Ari said that on Mount Carmel, uh, there's a huge conflict, of course, right? The famous conflict between Elijah and the prophets of Baal, where God makes it absolutely crystal clear that he is the Lord of all. And why does that make a big difference for worshipers of Baal in this time? Do you remember what Elijah brought about in the land of Israel at the, because of God's work? What, what happened to the land of Israel at that time? No rain. No rain. Now, why would that matter when you think about Baal? Do you guys know what Baal was known for? 
rain. <laughs> he was known for rain, known for a number of things. He was sometimes called the Lord of the heavens, the Lord of the storm, the Lord of fertility. He was the one who's going to bring these, these in his battle with his mythological counterparts. If he wins, they get seven years of flourishing surplus and the land is, is healthy. That was, that was their belief. Well, what if he loses? Seven years of famine. Okay, so now, I just think this is so interesting that as Elijah is, is going to war against these Baal prophets, and we see this stunning rebuke by the Lord of this worship, I was just so intrigued by the fact that when, we were, when I was studying through this, that as Elijah is battling them and, and going, to, going out against them, the famine does not last seven years which would be expected in Baal worship. If Baal lost the battle, you'd expect the famine to last seven years. But one of the ways God seems to be showing himself to be what Ari just said, the Lord of all, say, I can stop a famine whenever I want to. I can start a famine and I can stop a famine whenever I want to. I can start rain and I can stop rain whenever I want to. I can rain down fire on this altar when, when, when your, all your prophets are watching and Baal can't do anything. It's stunning if you think about how God, every step of these little details of these stories, that God is showing that he is supreme. He is sovereign. He is in control of all these things. And he's using people like the men of God that he sent these ways. He, he uses men like Elijah to, to illustrate that so poignantly. Anyway, just a little, little dabbling in the stories there. We already kind of know something about these people. Um, this is a little bit more about uh, Jezebel. And this is kind of what we were just talking about. Uh, she encouraged a large group of false prophets uh, with the devotees of Baal. And, and later, this is, this is what we were talking about. She actually goes directly against Yahweh herself. Um, are you guys familiar with Naboth's vineyard? Uh, this is another major sin, major issue between Ahab and Naboth. Now, Naboth uh, is trying to say, wh what ends up happening is Ahab comes to Naboth demanding his vineyard um, to kind of right of conquest over his vineyard and say, you need to give that to me for my vegetables. He really wanted to grow some sweet vegetables there, um, apparently. But it was against the law. There's, there's a, a law that Naboth is referencing. It's against the law for this land to be sold out from under his inheritance because it's, it's for his people, it's for his family. It's, it's a family land, and it can't be sold out of that. And instead of that, what ends up happening? Instead of, instead of showing his allegiance to the law of God, this is one more way that Ahab is proving himself to be lawless and in opposition to Yahweh and his commandments. He overrides that, and what ends up happening? Yeah, so Jezebel comes in and says, uh, no, don't pout about this. Ahab was pouting. Ahab was like, you won't give me the land. You know, and Jezebel says, like, take it. Murder him and take it. So th these are the kind of counselors around Ahab, and he, what does he do? He just goes right along and ends up um, taking Naboth's vineyard by force. Um, again, just in complete uh, opposition to God and his law. Um, there's a, he had a picture for us. It's a wall at Ahab's palace. It's an interesting picture. Um, <laughs> uh, and then uh, this is now going into that uh, story we were talking about there about Elijah. I think it's really helpful to kind of show the route that Elijah took in his battle against Ahab and, and Jezebel uh, throughout. Uh, you'll notice here is where it begins. Uh, he starts there. Elijah starts uh, in uh, Samaria. This is where he prophesies a three-year drought. Okay. This is where Elijah starts that. Then he'll head to the brook of Cherith. It's called a few different things, but that, that's the common name for it, Cherith. Um, then when the brook dries up there, Elijah heads up to Zarephath, and then he stays there three years with a, a widow and her son. Um, and of course, we're a little familiar with that story. Um, but after that, uh, moving uh, forward from there, 
This is, his, this is the path he charts. Uh, Elijah now goes to Ahab to tell him to gather the people of Israel and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. This is what Ari was referring to. The big showdown on Carmel uh, or Carmel. The Lord proves here that he alone is God, um, sending down fire on Elijah's sacrifice. Um, and, uh, and that's where the 450 prophets of Baal are put to death. Uh, so right there in Mount Carmel. Forward. This is kind of that high-level view of Elijah's um, battle against Ahab and Jezebel. This is where the drought ends now. Now that he's defeated the Baal prophets, the drought ends with a great storm. Elijah returns to Jezreel, which you'll notice is relatively close to Mount Carmel, just down the valley there. Uh, And there Ahab's wife Jezebel vows immediate revenge for the death of her prophets. Um, Elijah runs for his life, and he starts heading down now uh, to Beersheba. um, and, uh, And that's where he ends up going. From there, forward, chart Elijah's track here, goes from Beersheba, he journeys into the desert, he's depressed and weak, Um, he's strengthened then for the journey to Mount Sinai, Uh, and at Sinai, Elijah receives a vision of God. And then from there, he's going to head back up to Israel to appoint Elisha as his successor. Do you guys remember the story of Elijah crying out to the Lord in his distress. Do you remember what Elijah says about the state of God's work in Israel as it relates specifically to the prophets? What does Elijah say in his distress to the Lord? I'm the only one left. Now, that'd be a, that's a little weird for Elijah to say, don't you think? Because he, um, he had just encountered Obadiah earlier. When he, when he called out Ahab, he goes to Obadiah and says, and Obadiah is a faithful man. He's kind of an undercover for the Lord, you know, in Ahab's court. He, he hid a hundred, <clears throat> about a hundred prophets of the Lord. Obadiah said, hey, you guys need to go hide in the caves. I'll bring you food and water. You guys stay safe. And Obadiah goes and keeps working for Ahab, but he's feeding the prophets of God. Elijah knows this. And yet in his utter despair and his travels, he's running away from Jezebel's murderous threats. And he says to the Lord, I alone am left, Lord. And I, I just think it's so real. We see the real character. Of these, and they, these, are, these are not superheroes. That, that's really important for us to recognize. And, and yet the Lord meets him in that despair and says... No, <laughs> I, have, I have plans you don't know about. Whoa, whoa, Becky. God had 7,000. I have 7,000. I, I have thousands that have not yet bowed the knee to Baal. Don't, don't, don't have a pity party. I'm at work. It's not just you, it's me. <laughs> God is saying, this is not the right response to mur- murderous threats. I've got you. I've got you. And more importantly, I've got my plans. My plans are in motion. They're, they cannot be stopped by some pretender uh, and, their, and their acolytes um, that Baal and Ahab and Jezebel uh, certainly were. It's amazing. I just love to see God's working that sovereign thread through all of this and still interacting with real, real humans who are struggling through these, these times. We, need, we sometimes forget in these big Bible stories that these real human beings working through this, and God is so kind and so gracious, and yet also firm with his people and says, I'm, I'm, I'm at work here. Trust me. Um, from there, uh, you'll notice uh, this is where... Um, the, the end of the story essentially happens. Um, this is where uh, King Ben-Hadad of Syria had promised uh, to return to the northern territory of Gilead to Israelite rule. He'd promised to give that back to, for, for, Israelite, uh, for Israel to rule, <clears throat> but he'd not done this. So then what happens is, here, Jehoshaphat um, of Judah goes to Samaria, and Ahab of Israel urges him to join in attacking uh, the Syrians at Ramoth-Gilead, because they hadn't uh, done what they were supposed to do. Uh, Ahab here consults uh, his court prophets, and they all predict. Ahab says, Ahab's prophets say, yeah, go to war because you're going to win. Success. Except for one. Do you guys remember the prophet who was kind of a naysayer? Micaiah 
says no. And Ahab says, this guy always gives me trouble. You remember this story? This guy always gives me trouble. He's always telling me that it's not going to go well. He has a reputation for giving me bad news. And he tells Ahab that his army will soon be scattered and without a leader. So what does Ahab do? Ahab throws Micaiah into prison until his return. <laughs> That's the plan, anyway. Uh, and then he heads for battle alongside Jehoshaphat, who's, who he's enlisted to be with him. Uh, and during the battle, 32 chariots have orders to seek out and kill Ahab. Isn't that amazing? 32 chariots have orders to seek out and kill Ahab. How does Ahab die, though? A random arrow? Isn't that another amazing example of God's sovereignty in this scenario? There's nothing random with the Lord. Ahab had all these plans. He had all these intentions to skirt under the radar, ignore the prophet of God who was telling him he was going to lose and not to go. He, was, he had all these plans. And God says, no, I have one plan. And it will come to pass. Just like Micaiah said. And so... A, from our perspective, a random arrow. We don't even know who shot it. A random arrow finds a gap in Ahab's armor and fatally wounds him. He pulls back, stays in the battle to try to reassure his soldiers, but at sunset Ahab dies and his army is scattered, as predicted by Micaiah. And so uh, closes the chapter of, of an um, incredibly wicked and, and, and godless, lawless man. Yeah, Jezebel certainly meets her end as well, just as predicted. What ends up happening is Jehu now is maybe the closest, uh, and we'll probably uh, close with this. So I'll move to Jehu. Jehu's the closest they get to a righteous king, but he was, a, he was brutal. He was a ruthless king. He was fulfilling, certainly, God's plans to, to punish and hold to account those who had been so wicked prior. But, but uh, he was an assassin who basically took over the place and killed everybody. I mean, it's, it's horrific, but at the same time, it's God's, it's God's punishment that fits what Jezebel had set herself up to be. God is, God is um, fully uh, condemning her um, in Jehu coming, coming back. So he comes back. Um, there's a great summary here. Religious apostasy reached such an extent in Israel that um, a revolt was instigated by Elisha's appointing a prophet to anoint Jehu king. So what happens... Now he comes and he kills both Jehoram and Ahaziah, king of Israel. These ones who, who had taken the, these are the sons who had taken the throne from their father, um, uh, from Ahab. Uh, and then uh, the new king, now Jehu, entered Jezreel and had Jezebel put to death. Um, he basically cleans house. He eradicates all the opposition, uh, executing all of Ahab's family and followers, uh, stamps out the worship of Baal. This is where it's like, we, oh, we're doing the right thing. We're, we're executing justice according to God's plan. Uh, we're, we're eradicating the worship of Baal. Um, and then Jehu himself continues in that very same apostasy by worshiping the golden calves at Bethel and Dan. It's almost like he comes so close and yet so far, um, tragically. So um, he ends up following that very same apostasy that who set up from the very beginning? Jeroboam. So from the very beginning, the foundations of this kingdom were on shaky ground. And it, it continued all the way even through um, Jehu. Uh, but yeah, he ultimately, this is what, uh, this is where I think we'll, we'll end the primary, you know, material we've made it through. Um, the, the striking thing, I think, it, it can be hard to look at some of these hard passages of Scripture where there's just so much wickedness, so much apostasy, so much rebellion against the Lord. Um, and yet I think it's important for us, what, what's the thing that we need to consider? What are some questions we need to consider uh, from this uh, chapter in Israel's history? Um, what did God... What was God doing in tolerating the sin here, allowing the sin to go on for so long? Why would God do that? What does that show us about himself? Becky said he's long-suffering. He's not just turning a blind eye. He is, you'll see, we just, all through those stories, we had God judging his people, disciplining them holding people to account in various ways through, and yet he is very long-suffering with his people. 
And even in establishing Jeroboam, he has promises of grace that if you follow me, I'll be with you. And they don't, they don't. but yeah, long-suffering, absolutely. Anything else? What, what else do you see about God's character? As we move through these kind of harder, darker times in Israel's history. God keeps his promises. Absolutely. God keeps his promises. Then we're going to add some. Yeah, he shows he's the absolute judge. Amen. God is showing that there is no justice above his justice. He cannot be co-opted. He's not a, he's not a co-regent with anyone. He doesn't share his glory with another. His promises always come true. He's long-suffering. He is the king over all kings, Lord over all lords, the one true God. Even in these dark times of Israel's history, we can see the bright shining light of God's character come through, who he is and what he's doing with his people. Yeah, Gus. Yeah, it's a glorious reminder of that story uh, where he opens the eyes of the servant to behold the chariots of God surrounding them. That there's, there's far greater is he who is with us than he who is with, in the world. Um, we have nothing to fear. God is on our side. He is the, the Lord of hosts. He's the Lord of heaven's armies. In full control and full power over all things. It's, yeah, it's a wonderful story. It's hard, it's hard in a time like this to hit all these great stories. They're such good ones. Uh, but we had to highlight some of those, uh, those challenging ones for sure um, as well. Um, but it's wonderful to see that God is still in perfect, uh, total control and his power is, is unmatched. Um, we didn't quite get to the full extent of the Assyrian uh, uh, conquest of the land. I'll, I'll pass that along to John. He'll, he'll handle that at the beginning of next class. Um, but, I, but I would also like to draw our attention to something real quick. In this time of division, in this time of division, in Israel's history, it is incredibly important for us to remember the, the greater context of where this is going, right? Ultimately, and we see this in Isaiah, um, Isaiah 11 in particular, um, the good news is that God in his mercy has promised a reuniting of the kingdoms. Um, it says in that, in that passage, he will raise a banner for the nations and gather the exiles of Israel. He will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four quarters of the earth. Ephraim, which is what they typically, it's a name for northern Israel, Ephraim. Ephraim's jealousy will vanish and Judah's enemies will be destroyed. Ephraim will not be jealous of Judah, nor Judah hostile toward Ephraim. And we can look ahead and we can, we, rather we can look behind, we can look back and see that this took place in Israel's history at a particular time when Christ came. He was the one who would uh, fulfill all the prophecy of, of the Messiah, the seed of the Messiah would come to full, full and perfect fulfillment in him. Um, and at the end of the age, all uh, will be um, united again by God's grace. Um, those who are true believers in the Lord, true followers of, of God, um, they will in no way be left out. Um, Christ will um, come back too. We look ahead. Christ will come back as our conquering king and Savior, and uh, all will be joined together with him who are true followers.
followers of him and down through the ages. So uh, it's good to remember that uh, when the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, reigns in his millennial kingdom, all hostility, all jealousy, all these, all this wickedness we see on display in times like this and in our world today in many ways, all that will be resolved and gone. Um, all conflict will be put to rest. Um, we can look forward to that as, as believers in Christ. So let's pray with the hope of the resurrection and the hope of um, Christ's forever millennial reign forever um, into eternity uh, on our hearts. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this time. Thank you for the survey of, of history and, and um, events and people that we could look at today, Lord. Um, and just to see your uh, threads of, of theology woven through uh, these stories. Um, some of them of glorious victories that you won on behalf of your righteousness and, and to display your goodness and your righteousness. And, and sometimes, Lord, we see it as a backdrop, as a background against the horrible wickedness of people um, who are opposed to you and, and rebellious to you. And we see the, the, the glory of your character shining through. Um, Lord, we pray that as we uh, go forward to the rest of our, our day today and even in the coming days and weeks, Lord, that we would be reminded of your character through these stories, that, that, that these are not just um, fables or, or um, made-up fairy tales, Lord. These really happened. You really worked in real time and uh, worked alongside your people, uh, sustaining your people, um, providing for your people. And Lord, as we'll see in the coming weeks in this class even, uh, Lord, preparing uh, uh, Israel for the next stage, Lord, to bring about their redemption through the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we praise you for this time. We thank you, Lord, that someday, and we pray that it would be soon, Lord Jesus, that we would see you coming in all your glory um, and that you would put all hostility um, to rest forever in your reign. We love you, O Christ, and we pray your blessing over the remainder of our day. Amen.